Um, we have a number of new folks that have joined the district since the beginning of this school year and uh, since the beginning of January of this year. So this is kind of a um, welcome to the district, welcome to your job. I know you probably don't have a whole lot of understanding of the ins and outs of how the classroom works, um, but that's only for those people who have just been hired like yesterday. Um, so for those of you who have been here for a while and even since January, you already know, um, or at least you should have some good understanding of how the classroom works. Um, I am Lisa Munnerlin. I am uh, been the supervisor for mul the multiple disabilities department for probably, I think this is my 10th year. I can't, I can't count anymore. Um, about 10 years and I have grown to love grown to love my position. I, I think I love more of the, the aspects of getting to know many of you in the work that you do. Um, I haven't been able to get out and see all of you like I've been doing in the past. One of those things is because of COVID and the whole mask mandate and mask and running, masks and running around don't necessarily go together or they don't go hand in hand, but you know, no excuses. I um, am going to do better, but now the gas is over $4. I don't even know about that. So y'all might have to check, hit me up on um, this thing called Zoom or WebEx. Uh, if you need anything, you all know, uh, you can reach me at my email address at the bottom or just type in Lisa Munderland in your, um, your address and your, uh, email. Um, the way we're going to do questions again are going to be put them in the chat. I'm going to try and see as you know look at the chat as as much as I can. Um, but I believe Mr. Loach is here. And so we, I'm either going to have Mr. Loach or Nicole doing the uh, monitoring of the chat. So my moderators are going to be either of those two wonderful women and um, then we're going to keep on moving. So um, I may give you an opportunity to unmute yourself and say something, but I don't want all of y'all again uh, unmuted all at the same time. It, it can become really a, a pain. So anyway, trying to understand behaviors because some of this is going to be behavioral on the side of students, on the side of you, on the side of other staff members. Um, because as the, the picture says, I mean, trying to understand some people's behaviors is kind of like trying to smell the number nine. Uh, you'll never figure it out. And I don't know if it's a thing where you have to figure it out, but what you do have to do is you have to be mindful that not everybody's the same and not everybody's going to respond to um, the things the same, some things the same way as you do. So um, just be mindful. This is, this is a mindfulness um, lesson as well. <clears throat> Functions of all behaviors. So basically, I kind of took a little bit of uh, leeway from the behavior specialist um, in using some of their, their work because I don't believe in recreating the, uh, what is it, recreating the wheel. So there is something I want you guys to do right now. If you're not already asleep, I need you to close your eyes because this next slide, I'm going to read it to you. And listen, I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in my classroom. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As an educator, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture, or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. Folks, we are very, very, very instrumental in what happens in our classroom and what happens with our students and what happens with the other adults that we have to work with. You can open your eyes now. Um, but this is a quote from Dr. Haim Gano, who did a lot of studies on human behavior. 
and especially when it comes to working in a classroom with students with disability and students without disabilities. Because again, we all exhibit a behavior here or there um, because behaviors basically are what we use to get what we want, get what we need, to get a response from anybody who is needy around us. Um, those of you who have children who, you know, you know the cues that your kids give you when they need a certain thing and they don't have to verbalize it necessarily, but they do um, do something that <clears throat> could basically create or make or break your day. So just be, be mindful that what happens to you in your life last night, don't bring it into your classroom the next day because it may have a negative impact on those students. And you really don't want to start your day with any negativity. There's so much of that going on right now as it is. Um, here are some suggestions for ed educators from the so-called experts. They say, don't punish a child for symptoms of a true medical issue. Um, I was an ED teacher for the early part of my career. That's how I came into the district full time. Um, and one of the things that I've come, for, come away from that experience with is that if a student has been given a certain diagnosis, and as a result of that diagnosis, they're in a classroom specific to supposedly help that particular um, diagnosis of that child, a severe emotionally disturbed student is just that there has been some trauma that has created a situation where now um, at any you know trigger they could go off cuss you out punch at you do I was blessed I've never had to put seat pit a kid in a CPI hold um, verbal de-escalation is a great thing y'all um, but if you're punishing a child for the thing that they have, the dis their disability, then you're going to continue to do the wrong things. And so I've been trying to get the district to look at behaviors from a more prescriptive uh, side as opposed to a punitive, because we see a kid throw something down on the floor, we want to immediately take away something, we want to punish them, we want to create a situation where now you know, you have the power. And everything we do with students, more times than not, it is a power struggle. But at all times, you should still remain calm, cool, and collected. Because the last thing you want to do, and we'll get into this a little bit later, is to um, get yourself into a power struggle with a, a student. Um, you want to create a trauma-sensitive classroom where kids can feel safe and build resilience. Um, one of the things I used to do, and I'm Everything that I'm telling you guys, I've done. So I'm not telling you things that you're not going to be able to do or um, your teacher doesn't do. I'm not doing this to say, hey, this is what your teacher should do. You all can do this. You're educators. You're in that classroom with those students. You are a part of that classroom. You are a team. Um, you're a teammate of your classroom. Um, but greet and talk to them. Take some time to get to know who they are. Ask them how their their night was. You know, one of the things we used to do is talk about what what dinner you ate because I was real curious about some of the foods that um, my students were into and whether or not you know we decide what was a good dinner and what was a bad dinner. But I got this from my daughter. You you really shouldn't yuck somebody else's yum. So I, I kind of had to learn how not to be like, oh my gosh, you put ranch on everything? Yeah, so our kids I think are still doing the ranch thing. But anyway, offer a, com a comfort zone where kids can take a break and calm down. What I had in my, um, um, my classrooms, all of my classrooms that I've had, I've had a corner that I, where my bookcase was, I would have a couple bing bags. And one of the things I didn't do was disparage or discourage a student from going over there because sometimes they just want to be by themselves. Sometimes we just want to be by ourselves, but we're in the workspace, whereas they're in the educational space. And if they're learning how to uh, calm themselves, relax, um, not go over and go to sleep because that's definitely not what that space was for. And so you have to have your guidelines on what those spaces are for. Um, give short movement breaks. Um, at one point, I was working, um, I worked at, uh, hold on, give me a second, I gotta, 
I was working at Lenmore Middle School, probably its last two years, because I think it, it uh, closed shortly after that. <clears throat> and I'm looking for Melvina, but I can't find her. Uh, sorry, guys. Hold I'm on right here. A second. She's I'm in right Torbert, I'm, Lisa. I'm so sorry. She's in That's okay. Torbert, I'm, Torbert. I'm trying to make you the co-host, Melvina. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I can't find you in the in the in the the things. So I'm I'm working on that, Melvina. <laughs> no um, worries. So um, giving students a break, like every thirty minutes. Going back to when I was working at Linmore, one of the things that we were doing were single gendered classrooms. And I learned a lot about how girls and boys respond in, um, here we go, respond in certain environments. And I learned that boys don't necessarily like to sit for long periods of time. And they can um, make your life a little hectic if all they want to do is stand up. And I don't see a problem. I never saw a problem with that. As long as you're not touching anybody, creating a problem in the classroom, you can stand all day long because Lord knows I like to. Um, and so that was one of the things that I used to allow. The boys could stand, the girls could take their shoes off, they'd sit and read or whatever the, the work, uh, whatever we were studying or learning that day just make them comfortable because it's the more comfortable they are, not to the point of sleep, because one thing I would do is walk around and pinch your ears. Um, you wanna make sure that they don't have any need that will create a problem for the learning process. And your, pro your part of your work is making sure that they get what they need educationally and socially. And so making sure that you know, little breaks here and there. Part of that helps the classroom flow. Because if John wants to go to the restroom, he's going to make all kind of noise and you're going to be like, oh, and the teacher's going to be looking at you like, oh, can you get him? You know, and so one of the things you also have to do is be very, very proactive. Um, there's nothing worse than being reactive. And if you're, if you're getting to the point of reacting, you've waited too long to help that student. So just keep that in mind. Give options, because we all like options. If we don't have options, we feel like we're trapped in a corner. Um, and I'll give this example. Um, my grandson is two and a half going on 14, and he has now gotten into the point where he likes the Power Rangers, and he don't care what version, because I didn't realize there was like 150 of them. There's the, I can't even name them. But anyway, he wants to watch Power Rangers. And if he can't watch Power Rangers, he don't want to watch nothing. So we're trying to train him to understand you get choices, man. You could watch Clifford the Big Red Dog. You could watch the, I don't even like the uh, the uh, Mighty Four. Or there's something he likes that I'm like, mm, I'm a little skeptical because they showing some stuff that is like, that ain't kid friendly. But, uh, and uh, Daniel Tiger. So giving him all those choices, he's still not satisfied because it ain't the one he wants. So we're slowly but surely getting him to understand. So yesterday morning, he comes to me, he says, Grandma, I want to watch Blippy. Now, this is this 30-something-year-old dude who acts, he's a cross between Mr. Rogers and, uh, who's the dude? Mr. Rogers and Pee Wee Herman, of all people. Y'all need to Google this dude. But anyway, Malachi likes him. So he's realized, I'm not going to get what I want from Grandma. So I'm not going to ask her for what I really want but i am going to compromise because i do want to watch television so just saying choices are a great thing they will work to your advantage things to consider as a paraprofessional with ccs so right now we're going to do a take a little quiz so i need you to get your fingers ready um and i need you to type in your response your response is either going to be do or don't because these are some things and it's only 12 of them that I want you to respond to honestly. If you don't know, you don't know, and you will learn before you 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 before we're all done. That's one of the objectives is that you're going to know what you can do and what you can't do. And there's a billion things that you can do and a gazillion things that you can't do. But I'm only going to cover twelve. So hold students accountable. Should you? Should you not? Do or don't? 
absolutely do. You've got to hold your babies accountable for the things that they do that go against your classroom rules. And you should have a few classroom definite we don't do. And one of the things you will do or should do is hold them accountable for breaking any of your rules, your classroom rules. How about posting compromising pics or anything you wouldn't want your students or parents to see on your Facebook, TikTok, or your Instagram page? Definitely a don't. Um, as educators, people will see you from all over the world. And some of those people are even closer than you think. Everybody's not all over the world. Some of these folks who have befriended you on Facebook or whatever are part of your school family or part of the district family. And so if they see you doing some real shameless stuff, guess what? Your name is gonna be mud. There pretty much ain't gonna be nothing you're gonna be able to tell your chat, your, your, their, chi their child in your classroom who is your student. Um, so you gotta be careful about that. How about say that you don't like a student? Should you say that you don't like a student? Now, you should never say that you don't like anybody, especially in their presence, but I'm not telling you to go behind their back because there are some things that people do that you don't like what they do and not necessarily them. So no, you don't say that you don't like a student, but I'm gonna say this, guess what? If you don't like them nine times out of 10, they probably don't like you either. So catch that. <clears throat> Take anything a student says personally, should you? No, you should not. If your skin is that thin, you're in the wrong line of work. Absolutely wrong line of work. So if you take things personally from a child, then you, you might need to call somebody. <laughs> Tell them you might need another assignment outside of buildings. Um, respect. If you give it 10 times out of 10, you will get it back. So be as respectful as possible. Um, yeah, our kids are challenging. And some of them just need to learn how to know what respecting um, you is. What is respect to them? Because their line of whatever they think is respectful sometimes just isn't. Um, bringing your problems home, from home to work. Is that it? Should you or should you not? No, you should not. That's a don't. That's a huge don't. Um, that's not the place for it because your work just, it, it, it's, it's, it's incumbent upon the work that you do that you don't bring anything negative into the classroom. How about pick or play around with the students? You should not. Um, our babies sometimes don't have monitors, so they don't know what is going too far and what is not. So if you start something, be prepared because they will take it to the nth power and you'll be like, I was just playing. Um, don't play with them. What about showing favoritism? That used to be a big word a few years back. It probably still is. You don't show favoritism. Um, if you show favoritism, you show favoritism toward an action or a behavior, not a student. If you like the way a student is reading aloud and answering questions and raising their hands to speak, then you show favoritism toward, I like the way you raised your hand. I like the way you answered that question, but never, I like Miss Goddard over Tina or, or anybody, whoever. I'm just looking at names, y'all. Um, do you ever embarrass a student? Sometimes you don't know if you've embarrassed a student, but sometimes you should know if you've embarrassed a student. A lot of times if a student is misbehaving, they don't want to be put on blast because they're already doing something that everybody sees. So you might want to take them aside and have a conversation with them. Remember that that like, remember that like you, students have good and bad days. Do you remember that or don't you remember that? You should remember that these are people too. Yes, absolutely do remember like that you can have a bad day, so can they. Um, and you have to be just a responsive human being to that. <clears throat> what about assuming students understand behavioral expectations in every environment? No, you should not assume that. We shouldn't assume much of anything. Don't assume, because, uh, well, I ain't gonna do that, but <laughs> assume, assuming that a student can understand what the expectations are in any different um, environment, I think it's, 
probably not a, a good a good thing to do because we're st we're still teaching kids how to be in school. So there's still some things that they're doing that's not acceptable, but you're working on it. And by all means, do not, do not, do not argue with a child. If you have been brought to a point where you feel it's necessary to have a conversation that is going into an argument, again, you might need to rethink where you work. <clears throat> Now, what you should also do, these are six things that you can do to avoid that argument, avoid that power struggle. Because if a kid is oppositional, nine times or 10 times out of 10, they just want more control. And sometimes, again, when you go back and look at options that you can provide to them, that right there can help them with kind of harnessing the control. They're never gonna get the total control, not in my classroom. Um, but <laughs> you can train a child how to how to manage themselves in your classroom. <clears throat> First thing you should do, you should remain calm at all possibilities. Remain calm when a child is going into, into crisis or if, like I said, you can be proactive, keep them from getting there. Um, just remain calm because if you're, you're going around, running around like a chicken with your head cut off, guess what? They're going to be uh, exaggerated. It's going to be worse from them. Breathe. You need to relax by taking a deep breath and releasing it slowly. I'm learning how to breathe because I'm learning how to breathe. <laughs> Just learning how to breathe. And you also need to respond calmly. So when you've done your breathing, you've gotten yourself together, you're calm, cool, and collected. Now, when you speak to that child, you're not yelling at them. You're not you're not creating more problems than you need to. You just remain calm. Fourth one, keep your responses brief. When a kid is in crisis, when you're in crisis, what the last thing you want is somebody coming at you word vomiting. That's, that's what this picture is, word vomiting. And paraphrase, because sometimes we just have to listen and then repeat what, you, what the, the child has said to you that was a problem so that they know you're actually listening and you wanna help them. So you paraphrase what they're trying, what they said. So what I hear you saying is, so that, that when you repeat it back to them, number one, they know you've listened and number two, that you wanna help. And so you, you don't just harp on the, the behavior, but you're trying now to fix it. And the last thing, always treat students with dignity and respect. And so children are great imitators. So give them something great to imitate. If you run around again crazy, that's all they know. They're going to practice being crazy all the time. And crazy, I don't use that word lightly. And I don't mean to be dismissive in using that word, but that is a technical term. But what you don't want to look like in your classroom is crazy. <clears throat> Everybody wants a little bit of fame. So we want you guys to be famous. And in my eyes, you are because you, again, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the work that you do because again, boots on the ground, you guys are the fry cooks. Everybody loves the fry cook because if you ain't got good fries at McDonald's or Wendy's, y'all can forget about it. Nobody's going to go buy anything because nothing worse with your good burger than a bad fry. So. Your 15 minutes of frame should not look like this. 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 And it should not look like any of these other instances where people made horrible decisions. And you can go back from the first day that there was a classroom. Now, this stuff right here is all specific to your particular role in a classroom. Now, these people got in, they had clean records, but guess what? They records are not clean anymore and they definitely do not have a job in the place in which they were doing these offenses. So your 15 minutes of fame cannot include any of this foolishness. And I say foolishness very lightly, but it's not foolish. Fool this, this is crazy. Okay, I just use crazy again. Anyway, so stay out of the limelight. 
if you got problems you need to deal with, you need to quit your job and go get some help because the last thing you need to be doing is being in a classroom with kids. If you're triggered by any of this, you might need to call HR. <laughs> behaviors, all behaviors occur as a result of some need that's not being met. And so you have to think about that. When there is a behavior, you have to think about what does that child need? We've got a lot of students, especially in uh, multiple disabilities now that are coming into us in our district that wouldn't have, let's say 10 years ago because Franklin County services are no longer there for, for our families. And so we have students who are rockers. We have students who um, are nonverbal. So we have to, to, to be able to be able to figure out a way, find a way that we can best meet the needs of those students. And some of them have um, communication devices, but not all of them. Um, and so as educators, it's more important not to focus on what the misbehavior is, but how to address it while maintaining the continued learning for the whole class. Um, there's always a reason why misbehavior occurs in a class, but in the heat of the moment, it's partly your job to minimize the impact on the class as a whole when there is a behavior. <clears throat> and everybody needs something. Everybody has needs. And so as I, as I was researching some of the things to put into this PowerPoint, um, when you think about some of the research comes from memory and, and experiences. And so speaking um, or looking at how educators, and I consider you all educators, you're paraprofessionals because you work alongside your teachers, but you are educators nonetheless. And so as I, as I look at how educators speak to students, I quickly realize that it's not just the individuals that need that we need to focus on that have the, the some of the situations that they have, but more importantly, we need to focus on ourselves and how we manage um, a whole class at the same time as that particular student who may be causing problems. So we have to look at ourselves first. First of all, how are you going to deal with this? You know, are you going to deal with it in a respectful manner? Are you going to calm down, breathe, do those six steps before you um, delve in? Now, nine, now, what you're not going to do is wait for 10 minutes and do all your little steps while the kid is tearing up the class and you still sitting there trying to figure out what you're going to do first. Um, you got to be proactive because a lot of our kids give all kinds of hints before they do something. And then once they've been in your class, you already know, oh, there goes Lisa twisting her hair. When she twists her hair, she starts to get a little agitated and she wants to stand up. Then I tell y'all, I saw this baby and they said, he takes his clothes off and we just don't know how to stop him. He was a second grader, Sam. I ain't gonna say no more about it, his personal. But Sam would sit in that chair and the first thing he'd do, he'd throw that left leg up and he started untying that shoe. Before you know, not in 10 seconds flat, dude is down to his pull-up. So <laughs> I'm like, if you know that he gonna sit down and throw that left because he ain't switched yet, he hasn't started with his right foot ever, it's always the left, then you already know you need to go and help him out because he's about to get naked. And that ain't good for him because it's cold in that room. Why people do what they do, these are just a few things. If they want it, if, if there's a sense of, or a need of belonging, they're gonna be the class clown because they're gonna get the most attention. They are probably gonna be look, seeking some involvement with a gang, whatever that is, the bad kids in the, in the building, the, the good kid, whatever those operative bad and good, whatever that means, they're seeking some kind of, of, of closeness, a bond building um, kind of thing. And they can become the victim or the follower because the victims get all the shine. Everybody wants the guys to throw some pity at the victim, go throw them you know, some cheese puffs with some ranch on them. Um, <clears throat> don't forget the ranch. If they're looking for control. They, they're typically your oppositional student. Um, you see this a lot, like I said, in the ED classroom. Um, insubordination, things like even stealing. They want control. We all want to have some control. And our kids are no different. I mean, they're just little people. We're just old kids. Think about it. 
some of the behaviors that we had as kids, there are some folks who have been around you long enough to say, you still act like that. You might not think you do, but you do. We all want choice. So if a kid is late all the time because they choosing not to obey your rule because I need the choice to know that I can be a, come, in my class, come in your classroom when I feel like it. Um, and even retaliation and, and spacing out is a distancing mechanism that a lot of kids, we call it, I mean, sometimes you can look at it as like day, daydreaming and they're just may choose and not to, to pretty, pretty much listen to what you got going on because you might be boring or the teacher may be boring. Um, sometimes I used to think that as a, a ED teacher, I would have to come in and learn how to stand on my head while I'm teaching the algebraic equation. Um, just to keep entertaining because at that time, and I'm dating myself, but this has been, it's been a long time, but kids were still just starting to get in, uh, get into a lot of the video games and not going outside and playing. Um, and so, yeah, education was like ramped up against trying to make, you know, be entertaining because you also got the, the commercials were starting to be real entertaining. And then you're sitting there, you're just trying to teach a lesson and that can be boring and that can bring out some of those behaviors. And so keeping that classroom a little bit more exciting. I mean, it's, it's, it's a task, but it's, it's worth doing. Um, and then you got those kids who are seeking safety and some of their behaviors look like hoarding. Um, we've got a lot of kids who are transient, who are all constantly moving because of situations with the, the house. And if you look at now, they're building apartments on every every space in the city that didn't already have a building, they put in a new building there and it's housing two and three, 400 people in it. And the rents are exorbitant. So um, I have a feeling this may get, it may be getting worse than it will be better. Um, so we have to be those safe spaces for our kids. Um, and they may want to hang around staff again, they're seeking safety. So just a few things to kind of get you guys thinking about why you do what you do. The why of what you do should keep you excited about this, this work all the time. I mean, nobody's happy all the time because then I will really call you crazy. And I'm using the word in every um, sense of the word crazy. <laughs> but um, bottom line is, if you don't like this work, it's going to get tougher. And if you you really like it, you're gonna get great at it. And there's many of you that are in this district, many of you I hired when I got into this position and I'm glad to see that you're still here um, because you apparently love this work. And so thanks for being here. Um, and that's the end of my, my spiel. So now uh, Marvella, you still here? Who's doing the moderating? Because I guess I could just, I don't want everybody to unmute at the same time because that can be ooh, chaotic. But I um, am going to take some time and answer some of your questions, either about anything that I have um, gone through or if you have any questions about anything. If I can answer it, I will. If you have a question, if you can utilize the hand raise your hand and I will identify you. Did you say Mel Marvina or Melvina? Cause I'm Melvina. Melvina, did I say Marvina? I'm sorry, I'm my sorry. bad. <laughs> no, you're not. That's yes, serious. I, am. I don't play around with nobody's names. That I don't want to mess up your name ever. But I got a Marvella, <laughs> it was one of my neighbors in, in the Hudson. Anyway, I'm sorry. You so, are good, uh, Lisa. I was kidding. Um, actually, diagnostic. I'm going to unmute you if you have a question. Diagnostic. Diagnostics. That's a great name for an iPhone. Right. <laughs> Leave transfers. This is where if you okay. are out of the I guess they are, yeah, their hand no is question. raised, but there's no question. Transfer, 
I have no a question. Have any questions? Yeah. I okay. have a question. Um, I have Good a student. Good morning. I have a student that I deal with, and I, I, again, you have to love this job. And he debates about everything, and I'm not sure how to handle him. And I try to be nice <laughs> about the situation. I'm just being honest. And everybody's dealt with him and he's a foster kid. He knows the system and he uses it to his advantage. And he says he comes to school just because he has to and he doesn't want to go to any class. So yeah, I'm not sure how to deal with him. So he's definitely dealing with some control issues and it's probably why he's in, because he's in the foster system, he has no control over where he lands at the end of the day. And so um, I think just if, if I'm, um, now mind you, I'm not a behavior expert here. So let me put that clause out there like the doctors. I'm not a doctor. So anything I say to you is not prescriptive. It's suggestive. <laughs> but what okay. I would, what grade is he? Six. So sixth grade, they're, they're already a uh, little crazy, little, little mm -hmm. just trying to figure it out because they're the older kids in the building. Um, and they're getting ready to, to transition into being uh, now the babies once they go into um, okay. middle school. Mm -hmm. yep. And so he's got a lot of stuff going on. And, and I would suggest that um, maybe having the teacher reach out or you could do an email to one of the behavior specialists. Um, We've reached because... out to everybody. Uh, they, everybody. We have reached out to everybody at this point. We've reached out to even Franklin County Children's Services because he's done inappropriate things to other students. Wow. Yeah, I mean, he's got a, a lot going on. And so yes, he does. He's, he's, a lot, he's a lot less easy than I thought he was. So let me yeah, just yeah. Say that. it's a lot. It's a <laughs> lot. But he comes to school. He yes, comes he to does. school every day. Yes, unless he <laughs> gets suspended. babies. Mm. And he ain't gonna be being suspended all the time because some of what he's nope, doing is because you only get ten days. Part so of his IEP. Of well, that that's a falsehood, and and we're finally fleshing out that because it's not that, be nice. that he only gets. And, and but here's the deal: but if we're if we're really looking at these these children and trying to be as prescriptive as we can, we are just like you're trying to do: seek out best ways to kind of help him feel a little bit more secure. It's difficult mm -hmm. again because he's moving all over the place, probably doesn't know when he'll be moved again. So mm -hmm. he's always like grasping for something that is his and that he doesn't have to let go of. And so it's difficult. And so that's not one I can like answer right here. Okay. Just to be fair, I'm not going okay. to gonna sugarcoat. Blow smoke up your butt and call it <laughs> reverse gasoline. I don't know. I can't right. do that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a challenging situation. Again, you got to love your job to be here. So, Oh, absolutely. And I thank you for doing what you do. Um, thank you. And so, absolutely. It looks um, like Morris is next. Morris, Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. I have, I have a question regarding... Uh, students that we have that's on the spectrum that's uh, severe. Um, I have a few that are nonverbal, um, autistic, and there's things in the building that we can't control that um, are setting them off. Uh, for instance, noises, hallway noises, um, PA systems, lights, even the colors of the walls will aggravate these students. How do we help them feel comfortable in a situation where we have no control over the environment ourselves. Well, when you talk about sensory issues when, with hearing, um, I can provide you with some noise canceling headphones. Um, we have those. This particular I, student will not wear them. He doesn't like them on his head. Mm -hmm. um, we've tried all kinds of things. One. We've tried weighted. Um, we have a weighted animal um, helping him, you know, to feel secure like hug, uh -huh. um, that doesn't work. Um, there's no- Have you had one of the behavior, have you had one of the behavior specialists come out? We have, we have had um, 
Carol's been out there. Carolyn's been out there a couple of okay. times in our school, especially at the beginning of the year. Um, mm -hmm. I just am trying, I am a sibling um, of a nonverbal autistic brother. So I, I, I get where he is coming from. I just don't yeah. know how to help uh, the sensory overload because it, it is environmental. Gotcha. And con well, I mean, yeah, that's a lot going on that you can't do anything about, but is the classroom lighting, is it always the fluorescence? Do they have like the shades that you can put over the, I know in my office, I have the shading over the fluorescent lights, just the dull, the light. Uh, no, it is annoying. always the fluorescence. It's, you know, it's the brick and mortar old building. It's, it's Buckeye. Um, we have, um, you know, the, the hallways are noisy, the interchanging of the classes bother them. Uh, we have a couple yeah. of nonverbal autistic. Um, I am, uh, you know, I just really feel bad for them. Uh, this one in particular just sits perched on a chair covering his ears uh, because he is so overstimulated. So with classroom changes, can he go either before class change or wait till the halls are clear? We and do do that now. Just, we do do that now. We we go about five minutes before the rest of the building does. Um, mm -hmm. It's still a hard transition. It's the noise of the of our students with him. It's and we're so short staffed. We have two IAs. Yeah. We're two IAs down, so we're so short staffed. We have to go as a little group. We can't even afford to send one person with just him alone. If that makes sense. Oh, it makes a lot of sense in that you're not alone in that. Um, that unfortunately is pervasive across the district. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't have any easy fixes because one of the things that I know that does work for a lot of our kids are the noise canceling headphones, but maybe uh, some of the, and you can email me, I can send you depending on how many lights, number of uh, light fixtures you have in the classroom, I can send you, um, we'd have to order them, but I could send you some of the, the, they're just a light covering you put over the light, different colors, or like in Hudson, secretaries have gotten the blue ones. They look like there's clouds up there. So when you look up at the light, it's just blue background with white clouds on them. So, and it dulls the, the fluorescence. Yeah, anything, well. anything, you know, willing to try anything at this point, girl, I'm tired of being, getting the beat down. So. <laughs> I, I get it. I totally do. But I need you to send me an email and um, we'll get those ordered and sent over to you. Thank you. I definitely will do that. Absolutely. I appreciate the advice. Absolutely. I mean, it's the least I can give, but I'll, I'll have to study up the next time I say I'm going to do a presentation and have some questions. Um, if we can get, if, if I can, I'm sorry, I hate speaking. I'm the worst speaker. It makes me nervous. If we no, could not. get, um, some professional developments with people who specialize in the severe autistic cases, I would appreciate it considering we're getting more of an onset of those type of students. Well, have you, did you attend uh, or do you attend when I have the, uh, cause I've had, um, the summer programs. Kathy Mackley, no, even just in February, I had Kathy Mackley and Jenny Bryan come in from the, um, Ohio, what is it, Central Ohio Autism Society, Central, I, I Central did Autism Society of Central Ohio, you did? I did attend that, did and it, I did, um, but some of the information was helpful, others of it didn't pertain really to this specific student. Um, well, see, here's the deal, none of it's going to pertain to the specific student because again a student with autism is a student with autism because autism doesn't look the same across the board exactly so, yeah, exactly it's, it's, and it's you know we're getting good advice but it's for the majority not you know the few speckles of here and there that I don't know what to do with if that makes sense yeah that makes absolute sense and um yeah I'll do some more studying see what I can do thank you Lisa Absolutely. Lisa, it looks like Denise, Bannice, William is next, and then Jordan Allen. Hello, uh, Miss Lisa. How you doing, Miss Bandy? Is, is it Bandice? 
it's it's so you know working with kids they have a hard time saying names it's actually candace williams sonya williams daughter from afrocentric <laughs> So oh my it, gosh, no. One of your Get old out. babies. Oh my gosh. See, this is real. Because that really. Lisa, I literally only wanted to say it's not a question, but I just want to say thank you. This PD was great. I'm I'm newly You're hired to schools. I've been here. Well, a month. Welcome. And so, and you know, you've known me since before I knew myself. Baby. And yes. <laughs> Man, it's good to, to say, see that big bandus. <laughs> right. And that literally and that literally came from working with kids and me struggling with them calling me Miss Kins. Because you know kids can't say the names all the time. So we just let it yeah. stay. <laughs> but yes, I just wanted to say yes. I just want to say thank you, not just for this professional development, but you've always been great at this work. You are one of the people well, who I you. can who I can say is the reason I'm in education. And I've been in education since Man. I've graduated high school. Stop. I- okay, <laughs> Candace, I want you to stop now. Um, I appreciate you. I love you and your family and let your family say, know that I said Absolutely. hello. Absolutely. And, and I do and appreciate thank you for doing this. Here. Absolutely. I was thank excited you. when I saw your name, I was like, and this is my, I was like, this is my breakout session. I was like, oh yeah. So I, I, I thought this was very great. I appreciate all of the awesome. tips and your engagement. And that's all I wanted to say. I love you. And it's great to well, see you. Thank you. Love you back. Thank you. All right, Jordan, top that. Oh, well, it's hard too. Um, well, my mom says, hi, she's Jamie Allen. That's, that's all I got. Hi, Jamie Allen. <laughs> Tell her I said, hello. How's she doing over there? <laughs> No problem. I just had a quick question. Um, I was just wondering, how do you guys handle it on the other side? You know, you always have the problematic children where you kind of expect their attitude or something like that. But I seem to be having an opposite issue that I'm getting a lot of, like, um, a lot of fight from the kids that are doing really well in the school, and they now feel entitled that they don't have to follow the rules any longer because they're either getting all A's or something of that nature. So we're starting to have issues, you know, tardies here and there. And we've implemented, we've implemented um, our own new strategies like um, lunch detention and the kids are just up in arms about it. And so I've had to had, had to have a lot of personal conversations with the kids to tell them, Mm -hmm. you know, you still have to do what you do, even though other people aren't doing what they're doing. But I just don't know, since I'm new to kids and stuff, like how to handle it, you know? Uh, that's, that's, that's real. That's new to me. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I am going to say I ain't never. I have not ever. Right. Ain't ever. Oh, have not man. ever experienced that side. Might be. Um, <laughs> I just think that. The more exciting the classroom is, the more inviting the classroom is, because some of y'all got to admit, some of y'all classrooms look like trash. <laughs> uh, it is because of multi, multi things. But if your classroom is inviting, and that means if y'all have an art class, if they, they go to art and they come and show you something and they give it to you, hang it. Make it look mm. like they own that space because you want to be in a space that looks good and you help create. I'm going to just say for my classroom, for the most part, I mean, the rules we had, the kids helped make, create those rules. They didn't have a final say. And I let them know that all the time. I got the final say, but we post them as a reminder to them. And so they look to certain spaces and areas. And like I said, when I have my, my reading corner, it's, inviting and I have hot chocolate I have a hot pot I have a I create a space for kids to want to be in and sometimes and I'm not look again this ain't for everybody because everybody's room don't look like trash but some of y'all's teachers ain't taking the time to really do the work so maybe sometimes y'all might have to help them um Mm. but just I mean make it so they want to be there I don't know Mm -hmm. how to I don't know because that's okay. Different. Nope. Thank you. That that's okay. <laughs> I'm thank sorry. you. I gotta do some research. I'm writing stuff down, y'all. No problem. Thank you for your question. Or yeah, all of that. Now there's one in um 
Jasmine. I am an IA at Dominion. I have an, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, Jasmine, you want to come unmute it? Because here's what I'm going to tell you. For you to get CEUs, I would say for you, you should send an email to Greg Mile. Okay, Greg Mile. M I L D. Yes, Greg Mild, M I L D. And he would be the best person to um, answer those questions because, yeah, yeah, because that'll help you moving further. If you're, are you in school to, to become, are you trying to be a teacher? Oh, you are. Pre K. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. So, yes, Greg Mild. Okay, I will email, I will send him an email. Thank you. Awesome. Absolutely. And back to the lights. I see Andrew. Thank you, Andrew Connor. Um, he says we turn our lights off and use colored lights around the classroom to avoid sensory issues. Calm lighting is blue, kind of the violets, I think, are calmer um, colors. But again, if you can't change the lights because of where how far up they are or whatever, you can ask your custodian to put these, um, these, they're like I can't even, they're just uh, coverings over the, the lighting so it dulls it because that fluorescent crap is, is for the birds. Kathy says, in my peak calming room, LED lights are used instead of using overhead fluorescent lighting. Lights around white bulletin boards, the lighting provides enough light. Is LED effective in creating a calm room? Because I don't know, LED to me seems real harsh light. Kathy, you want to speak to that? Yes, um, it's like the white Christmas lights. And so we have them around the bulletin board and I'll ask if like if a student comes and they have work to do, do you want me to turn, over the, turn on the overheads? And they say no, because it's a calming room. We also put mm -hmm. in, um, sensory um those tulips that give out the scent and we yeah. use that so they're they're hearing it's quiet in there they're seeing it's it's just calming for them so we do have students that ask can i go to the calming room for five minutes and take a break so they're out of all that lighting and they're just yeah. in the dark not really dark and you can still see but yeah they right help right a lot uh-huh for those of you who, if anybody has come and visited me at Hudson, you will find that we have the darkest room in the building. Um, and it's not because we just, we trying to save energy. We use two lamps in our room because the fluorescent lighting is so agitative. And I see Ash put in there, um, fluorescent lights are very institutionalized. Maybe that's, that's the thing is that they're in, some of the most sterile places, your hospitals, your libraries, they're play in places where, mm, I don't know, you might want to be in the library a lot, but not in the hospital. So maybe that's my um, annoyance with fluorescent. But if you have natural lighting, open up those blinds, let that natural light come in. Um, the I think the fluorescent lights have a, they have some kind of weird effect on us. Um, so yeah, I like that. And um, So Kathy, when you say the Christmas lights, are these clear lights so you can see the filament or are they just white light? They're just the uh, white lights that we had on the Christmas tree and I decorated okay. the room for Christmas. So it works, the principal liked it. And a lot of the teachers, they'll come in and sit a few minutes to take a breather in there too. So mm. they're just something I got at Family Dollar for a dollar and just nice. put it around it. Yeah, that's a great investment. I mean, mm -hmm. anything that helps our kids. Um, I see it's 957 and you guys have a full day. I want to thank you. Um, I can take, I'm going to take one more. If there's another question, no more questions. And I will believe that everybody, all minds are clear on everything. Um, uh, actually, hello. Okay, yeah, Tony. Actually, actually, just real quick on the fluorescent lighting. There has been a study that was done on fluorescent lighting that over a period of time, it actually gives you headaches. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of documented studies surrounding fluorescent lighting. So just wanted to share that. 
Tony J with all of the info. That's what we need. Because all of y'all together, collectively, we can solve some of the problems we have in our classrooms. And so I do believe that. I mean, they do a study on everything. So I can I can believe that. And um, yeah, so those fluorescent lights got to go. Or like I said, you guys ask your teachers, ask your principals. Your principals are there. They want to help you, but they need to know how to help you. And if getting those um, covers for those lighting fixtures will help, I know they will. They help me. And I I share an office with uh, Terry McGurn. I love her. She's my sister from another mister. <laughs> but she is off the wall sometimes. And so she has to come in and just calm down because, oh, another thing real quick, the um, diffusers with some um, lavender, calm. A little bit of music in the background, calm, instrumental. You don't want everybody getting up and singing some of the latest rap lyrics because they're trash. But anyway, thank you guys. I appreciate you joining me today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. If you have any questions, again, if you need anything that I can help you with, please email me. I appreciate you all. Thank you all for being here and have a wonderful day.